Good morning, everyone. Um, so finally, we had uh, a slightly nicer day out there. So I hope uh, the audience will, will stay with us. There's not the rain that keeps you from running outside. But we do have an amazing panel today. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce um, the speakers. Um, and we'll start from there. So um, first, we have um, Aaron Sissant, who's um, the founding director of the Fini Foundation, who's London's largest host of international residents for artists, curators, and thinkers. And um, of course, today we're going to talk about collecting, but he's going to share with us that he doesn't collect things, he collects ideas. So we we'll hear more from Aaron later on. Uh, we also have uh, Philip Kier, who's, um, who's founded uh, his own foundation to support um, arts and the human rights and you know the foundation has worked very much in the intersection of visual arts and dance and Philip before he set up his foundation has been a man of many talents he's um, actually run the Sydney Bionu he started an art fair uh, so we hear from Philip later on on how all that different interest and passion feed off each other and last but not least uh, we also have uh, Hideki Fukutake who's the vice president of uh, Fukutake Foundation which operates uh, the Benese art site Naoshima which I think many of you either would have been or heard of and if you've heard of it I'm sure all of you are thinking about going. It's really a wonderful um, place for outdoor art. Um, and of course, they are the very important contributor to the Setouchi Triennial, which is on this year. So we're going to hear a little bit from uh, Hideki on how the foundation has built the Naoshima project and how he go around in collecting. So these are the three uh, panelists that we have. So um, maybe I'll start um, with the same question to everyone. Um, and maybe I start with Philip, if that's okay, which is um, why, did, when did you start collecting and why did you do that? Hello. Um, well, I originally started as an artist, so um, I studied dance in New York in the 70s and performance um, as well. I eventually became a kind of, kind of theatre person. So my first... Um, I guess I first came across visual artists because I was part of that um, downtown uh, New York scene. And I guess it's out of knowing artists that I started collecting art. So I didn't set out one day to say, look, I want to build a collection. And at that, at that time, I was a poor, a poor artist myself anyway, so I had no money to do this. But So it was initially really knowing artists and gradually getting to know more artists and then gradually starting to, to, to collect some pieces, and then that gradually built up over time. Great. So starting as an artist, but going into collecting. Yeah. That's great. Uh, how about you, Aaron? So you said uh, you don't collect things, you collect ideas. Do you yes. want to share a little bit Yeah, more I think what the, that means? the radical word in the title of the panel probably applies to our work at Delfina Foundation. Um, we were founded by uh, a philanthropist who has a collection. Yet in Steel, she does not collect via the foundation itself, but has always used the work of the foundation to create a family, but also to create a collection of knowledge, because at the end of the day, that's what uh, a collection actually is, of artworks, is a way of kind of building, building knowledge. And through our residency program, we um, concentrate artists, curators, and thinkers around certain issues and ideas, and then we use this knowledge to further uh, promote their work, but also to commission new research and also productions from that as well. Many of these, uh, many of the outcomes of the residencies do find their way into museums, galleries, biennials, um, very, very often. Yet and still, we have never had a, a practice ourselves of collecting that work, rather than developing the knowledge that goes out into the world and is disseminated via these, via these, these particular objects. And I think the word kind of collection in our context is, is very relevant because like one would build a collection we, that's based around themes, we invite and commission artists also around kind of common ideas and, and interests that, that we share. But more importantly, although we are residency space, we aren't passive within the uh, process of facilitating the residencies. We very, we're very, very active. And I think in many ways we consider ourselves to be a repository of the knowledge that comes through the program. It's not that an artist comes with their 
with their insights, then make a work and then leave with their work and with that knowledge is that we actually retain a lot of that, the content that happens there for the next generation of artists or for, or for the next time we revisit a certain theme. And to give us just a small example, um, you know, the kind of themes that we investigate are things like the politics of food or we'll look at certain practices that are unrepresented and undersupported, like performance, for example. So I'll leave it there, Alan. That's great. So it sounds like collecting for you is about incubating an idea, but you do say that the work you know, eventually make their way to museums and institution collection. Which Absolutely. Is I mean, yeah. the discovery section here at Art Basel, Hong Kong, I think two, two or three years ago, um, had worked by an artist called Nadia Kabelinke, which won the Discoveries Prize. It was an experimental gallery. And that entire body of work was produced by our residency program a few years uh, earlier. So they make their way into kind of like the marketplace, yet and still we're not interested in acquiring kind of those objects. We say we, in a way, collect the artists, because what we mean by that is the actual relationships with them as people and therefore our collection and what we acquire is constantly evolving and changing and also responding to, to kind of current and relevant issues. I think collecting, the idea of collecting but not owning is very interesting. We're going to come back to that. Um, Hideki, so um, the, the foundation and you know the Naoshima project over, over the years have built up a, a fantastic foundation uh, um, collection and you've built structures and architecture around it. So maybe you can share a little bit of when did the foundation started collecting and why did that start it? Hi. Uh, well, our project actually, I'm sorry, I'm speaking in Japanese, so could you please wear the headset? Our project started actually about 33 zero years ago. And uh, of course, the original collection is my grandfather, actually. Uh, he was uh, uh, residing in Okayama, and he collected the uh, Okayama artist's uh, works. Uh, well, my grandfather, he is now 93 years old, and he is still painting. Uh, well, I'm not uh, really like uh, his work, but he's still doing it. And uh, uh, my father started this uh, art project project actually. The, the taste of the art is more than art which conveys strong message. Uh, that's what we started. I think later on I will explain to you uh, the details of the project, but personally the, uh, the, the reason why we, collect, we started collection is that about 15 years ago, uh, I, uh, first time I purchased the works. Actually, it is not by myself. My uh, wife uh, bought a vase, uh, which was about $1,000. And I just started to work. Uh, $1,000 was quite a big amount of money, so I had to argue with my wife. Uh, but then uh, this uh, vase doesn't have uh, any opening to put the flowers. And then yet it cost us $1,000, so I was so shocked. Uh, personally, I, uh, well, at that time, I thought that this is not practical. This is not the more, this may be the modern art, but not practical. Uh, but then later on, I uh, really uh, thought about it, and then I have started the collection. But in our foundation, rather than being the collector, uh, what we are doing is we are carrying out a lot of projects, and that is uh, making the art uh, as a tool to send the messages. That's wonderful. So, you know, I see a little bit of common trail here as well. Philip, as an artist, your grandfather is an artist that started it, but it's that thousand dollar vase that started all of it. Um, so I think maybe one more question to you, which is, you know, as the collection grew, um, there are so many different influences. I guess, you know, starting with your, your grandfather and, and your father, and then now you said, you know, with, with the vast purchase, you, you started building a collection about 10 years ago. So what shaped your collecting strategy? Like, what are the areas that you're collecting? Is that more things that you like, or is it things that you think reflect what's going on in the society?
Well, in the past 30 years, our collection style has changed quite a lot. Well, I can talk to you later, but to put it simple, well, we have been carrying out activities. So in order to achieve the objective of the activity, we buy the arts. First, we look at the art. And then it has to have a very strong impression. It has to give the strong pro impression. And also, it has to be very tasty. I don't know how to express this in English, but you know, it's like a chewing gum. Yeah. So if you chew, and then you feel more tasty. So, of course, beautiful thing is beautiful. Well, the beautiful lady, for example, it doesn't matter what religion she is or you know what culture she is in, still beautiful is beautiful. The food is the same thing. Well, if you taste something very nice and uh, well, if you look at uh, my uh, uh, son, he likes a McDonald potato. Well, uh, all the kids uh, like, uh, you know, uh, tasty or sweet things. Uh, but then what they do is they don't chew too much and then they uh, eat right away. Uh, but then at the end of the day, they get uh, bored. Uh, but then in Japan, we have a traditional washoku, Japanese food, that is not uh, very, very salty. Uh, but then the more you eat, uh, then you, you digest and then and you feel, you feel enjoyment. Uh, so every time you see it, there is a new discovery. So a uh, very complicated uh, cultural background. Th those are the ones we buy. So uh, in Naoshima, you look at uh, arts, they are all permanent arts. Uh, but I think uh, and, you know, visitors feel that uh, even they come 10 times, each time they feel different things and they get different impressions. Interesting. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to hear um, how the collection you, you see is very permanent, but it changes every time. And I guess, you know, in some way that's errant to, to, to what you're doing, what you collect is very much like that, which is, it's not an object, right? It, uh, it's residence, it's knowledge. So how do you decide what are the things that you collect in the foundation? Um, I think this is a very interesting kind of question, Alan. Um, and how we as an organization define the themes that we're going to engage in, they often come from, there's like, they're often kind of in the air and it's hard to kind of explain it. It's through lots of conversation with artists and curators and lots of listening to try and determine what is kind of the, the, the what will be the, fo the focus for uh, the program. The politics of food, for example, came um, out of um, uh, the horse meat scandal in the UK, for example, that was happening at the same time that we were thinking about doing a particular theme. The horse meat scandal in the UK was taking place. Um, the Arab Spring started in Tunisia with the fruit and vegetable salesman setting himself on fire. Um, and we we're also looking at how within artistic practice, artists were addressing the marriage between food and art. And this is, of course, you know, goes throughout history. It starts with, kind of, you know, well, even beyond the Renaissance painters of still lives, you know, to Gordon Matters Clark, restaurant food in Soho. Um, I skipped over the futurists, but of course they were there too present around food. And to how contemporary artists are looking at food and politics. And it's such a relevant um, issue particularly one to be explored within the context of the art world because matters of food and drink are very much close to how kind of like uh, the, the social nature kind of of the art world. So we want to look at it from a more critical point of view. And so it was very much topical, um, but then at the same time embedded already within artistic practice that we wanted to push, push slightly further. That's uh, uh, an issue-based theme on one hand. On the other hand, we've done programs that are based very much around um, disciplines. Um, I mentioned performance earlier, and I want to come back to that one, um, partly because in the last kind of last decade, in particular, performance art has become increasingly popular, and also um, 
platforms like B uh, biennales, but particularly art fairs, have also been using the medium as a way of uh, creating more uh, dynamic programming around their initiatives, yet and still the um, practice itself is so under-supported and also so under, kind of understood. Uh, and so at Delfina Foundation, we launched a thematic program that is focusing specifically on artists who work with performance, not necessarily performance artists, but with performance. And alongside that, we also launched an initiative to do research around the history of performance art in the Arab region of the world, um, because the genealogy of performance in that region hasn't really fully been explored. And uh, we actually launched a Kickstarter campaign with Art Basel, with the crowdfunding initiative um, two years ago, oh, yeah, yeah, which was highly successful. And we raised funds to do some research and also to stage two exhibitions in London. And it's just the beginning of a long-term research looking at performance art from the art world. So that's kind of one small example of how we find a need and then try to find a way in which the program can address it and then remain relevant through the process. Mm, very interesting. I'm going to come back to performance and how that is collected or not, because that's fascinating. But I think clearly a big takeaway from this talk today is emerging is the collecting strategies need to be tasty. You talk about food and, you know, Hideki is also about tasty work. What about you, Philip? What, uh, what is your collecting themes and strategy? Because I know that you also had a very strong dance and uh, um, performance background as well. Is that what you collect or is it a little bit more touchable? No, um, in quite the opposite. Um, so I tend to, uh, I guess, define what I do between my personal collection, which is very much a personal collection, and it's a very much a personal collection about things. And to some extent, I look for thingness. Um, um, I look for things that will exist outside time. And while uh, the performance work uh, that I'm involved with, uh, it tends to happen through the foundation, and of course that is um, usually um, happening in the time it's been, being done. Mm. So um, I am not at all interested in collecting performance. Mm. I think there's some major concerns with the way you do that, um, what happens with the work if you collect it and so on. So to go back to my personal interest is it's completely personal. So I see um, a private collection a bit like a private memoir. It's what you did, what you bought at a certain time. It's what you're interested in at a certain time. And of course, a collection travels through time as well. So you might have started with an interest in one area, and over time you get interest in something else. And um, so I think, um, yes, I see it as a completely a personal thing. I don't see it as a... Um, and I think the, the subtitle of this um, talk was um, whether a collective might be regarded as a creative and radical practice. Well, in one sense, I'm much more interested in that question of um, collecting being a creative practice because I think collecting, you can collect in as many ways as artists work. Um, and I think there's a certain equivalent sometimes in, in the way you collect with what an artist does. And so I think a collection can be about a whole lots of different things that often, as I say, um, go back to the personal, or at least in terms of a personal person collecting. I see. And, and Aaron, I mean, does that make sense to you? Because I think Philip is kind of talking about things very much in your area as well, and, and saying that performances and dance and, you know, more conceptual, I'm very difficult to collect. So what happened after you know, people have residences at um, your foundation? Um, well, firstly, to, to say, and uh, remind me of this question, because I'm going to say a, a preamble first. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out that um, we continually work with uh, the themes over a long period of time. And we also continually work with artists over a long period of time. They may come into residency for three months, but they also may come back again. Um, the outcome of their residency might be staged at a later exhibition for us, or we might place it, work with them to place it um, elsewhere. So in a way that one would have an art object that one would then tour or put into museum shows or have been written about or share, share privately or share publicly, we do the same thing with the artists who are in residence with us and the ideas around um, their, their practice. Um, I raise this in relation to kind of 
performance in a way that it is a very kind of like a uh, challenging medium even to support I think to, to a large degree as well as to think about the notion of kind of collecting um, there are a few collectors out there who do focus on ephemeral kind of works and 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 the performative works you often find and what's interesting about those kinds of collectors is that they're very interested and engaged in supporting the medium itself and the development of, of, of the medium. But yet and still, it is a hard thing uh, to, to collect. So what we're attempting to do with our, I guess our program is collect kind of the knowledge and nurture the practice itself rather than think about kind of collect, collecting it. I leave that discourse to the museums to kind of work out and to artists like Tino Segal who, who put very challenging kind of restrictions on, on his work. Yet and still, there is a way to I don't want to say own it, but to um, maybe reproduce it or restage it mm. in, 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 in such a way. But it, it, does, it does raise another area for kind of collectors as, as kind of, uh, as a radical, as well, like, well, I guess the role of the collector in a sense of how, because these questions, they're raising you know, to galleries and to artists. Even if they're not interested in acquiring them, they're raising the questions. Um, for example, there's a great kind of collector, Luis the Shade of the Freitas, who's also thinking about regulation of the art market because of what he's encountered himself as, as a collector. So I think the kind of importance of kind of the, the collector is raising kind of these questions so that we can all begin to how, think about how you take them on. Mm. And, you know, I, I think it's also interesting to hear that um, you know, I think both of you are saying that there could be a public part of it and, you know, the, the personal collection could be something very different. So maybe that's a question to Hidake as well, which is, you know, Naoshima and Benese obviously collect um, monumental work that you put up in the Naoshima sites. Is that something very separate from what um, the foundation or the family or yourself personally collected? Or do you always show it in the public? Uh, well, uh, actually, if you look at this project, uh, uh, there are a number of stakeholders and we cooperate together. Our main business is education business, and that's the company, uh, and then our foundation, and also some uh, uh, individual. We collaborate together, and then we carry out the project. So we don't consider this as a personal collection, uh, but then uh, our objective is we have a common objective. So we have one direction. Well, that is ideal place and very happy place. And you can live happily. That is the place we want to create. Well, when we try to do that in each area, we have to have a, a, a art which meets with that, uh, which fits with that particular area. Well, that is to enhance uh, the characteristics or attractiveness of that particular area. So we don't consider this as a collection. This is actually a commissioned work at the time. Uh, so uh, well, we have administration, local administration. So if we try to do it public, we have to do it in someone's uh, land or someone's facility. So when we have this, when we make this kind of uh, art, we then uh, we always talk to the residents because uh, people are still living there. So we have to really explain to them the concept many, many times, even sometimes dozens of times. And then uh, we create the. Uh, the art, so it's really a very a local char characteristic. There's a event. real participative element to what the, the project that you're doing on site as well, which you know probably apply to what uh, Aaron and Philip, you guys do as well. But just just to pick up on one thing that I find fascinating, which is you said, you know, it, that there are a couple of things that feed into what you're trying to do. Education being one of it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about? How does education and art come together uh, inside the Naoshima project? Uh, 
to begin with, uh, well, why we started uh, this Naoshima project, it, has, it had nothing to do with art at that time. Uh, this was the camping site for kids, originally. Well, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Benesse Corporation is the education provider. This is uh, distance learning. Okay, so uh, multicultural uh, uh, kids, they get together, and then uh, they can camp together, and then uh, we, and then kids can uh, exchange ideas. That was the first, uh, uh, that was the origin. At that time, Naoshima, uh, was uh, uh, not vibrant. So when the kids are gone, Naoshima you know, is uh, uh, not a very vibrant place. Uh, therefore, so we thought that uh, it, it is Naoshima. We, why don't we make Naoshima as a permanent place for young people to exchange ideas? So originally, this was a camping site. But then it eventually evolved, because young people look at the art, and then they started to communicate with the local residents. And also, a lot of uh, non-Japanese visited Naoshima. Uh, then we found out uh, there is no English-speaking guide. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we get the uh, middle school kids as a volunteer because they learn English in school. And then they started working as a guide, as a volunteer. So that's how it started. So you know, you really involve everyone in the community in that. Maybe I can ask Aaron and Philip the same question, which is, you know, in, in your practice, how do you involve other people in, in, in the community? Maybe starting with Aaron? Um, for us, the community isn't just a community at large. We also um, highly focus on the community of other creatives out there. So when we're building our thematic program of residencies, we don't always just invite artists. We also um, invite, uh, it ranges tremendously, architects, urban planners, chefs, scientists, it just depends on the theme that we're, we're exploring. Because again, it's about this idea of kind of producing the production of knowledge. Now once the, it's produced, <laughs> well, never ending. Uh, but once actually the objects, let's say, are produced, and of course there is um, uh, our public programs, our platform for um, engaging with a public. So we do a quite active series of talks debates, seminars, but also exhibitions, both at Delfina Foundation in London and also with partners um, throughout the world. And then we try and find ways in which we can bring together many of the different um, works that have been produced or the ideas that have been, that are being interrogated and find larger platforms uh, to house them. And, and also particularly things that are, uh, are, are engaging. So for example, I organized a wedding at Art Dubai Art Fair last week, which is a way of bringing together eight artist commissions, actually 10 commissions um, by eight of our former resident artists together, a context of a wedding to talk about the politics of food you know, as one kind of way in which we, that creates something that is very much kind of audience friendly. Um, but for us, first and foremost, I guess we've always thought about the art professionals being the first audience because of being a residency program for artists, of the idea of kind of collecting artists and nurturing them, you know, to, to proceed in their career, we first want to expose them to uh, other kind of collectors, curators, galleries, biennale, so that the next stage of their career kind of goes much beyond us. But one of the big uh, kind of collaborations that we also do is with big institutions. So we do a fellowship program with Tate, for example, and we've done co-commissioning with the Serpentine and other institutions in London. I, I love the idea of curator as the wedding planner. So <laughs> I think you can build a great business around that. Yes, I am. Um, I'm on the hire if you need me. <laughs> Yeah, Instagram account. For more Put out photos. your cards later. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Philip, how do you engage the, the community? So, um, <clears throat> what the what the Kier Foundation is most interested in is commissions, and and uh, more specifically, co commissions. So we try to develop commissions between different organisations, and we try to broker these relationships. So a recent um, commission was uh, uh, an Australian artist called Nick Mangan, who did a work that. Um, was co-commissioned between Chisholm um, a gallery in London and Artspace in Sydney. 
And, all, uh, and so the commission uh, worked between both places. There was about three months gap, I think. So, um, or similarly, there, uh, there was a, another commission, which was uh, Rana Hamaday had a, a work that was first appeared at the Nottingham Contemporary, then appeared at Showroom in London, and then appeared at the IMA in Brisbane. And we similarly tried to do some of these things with dance works. So um, there's, a, there's a dance uh, choreographer, artist called uh, Maria Hasabi. And so she'll be doing a work that is, has a theatrical version, if you like, that will appear in some places like um, the kitchen in New York. And we'll also have a, a gallery iteration as well. So that will appear in Nottingham. And then there'll be another version of that appearing in um, the Kunsten Festival in Brussels, and then uh, another version in Melbourne and at Dance House. So we try to broker these um, commissions for artists um, that extend, you know, often across four different institutions. And um, occasionally we do do some public programs. We do a commission series in uh, Australia, which is um, a choreographic award, and it, it involves eight commissions. And as part of that, we have a, an extensive public program that tries to investigate this question of what chore choreography is. And is, is that, um, does some of the previous things that you do, does that feed into you know, what you're doing right now? Because I think you, you study um, dance and performance, and you know, you're doing a lot of drama work. Yes, I, you've I, started an art I fair. <laughs> I originally right. um, studied at Merce Cunningham right. Dance School right. in, the, in the late 70s. Yeah. So um, I guess that's where a lot of the interest that I, I gained this interest uh, where um, art forms come together. So I mean, Merce Cunningham was famously included, you know, uh, a very strong um, visual component that often came through Rauschenberg mm. and others, mm. and John Cage contributed music and so on and so on. So in a very early sense, um, that kind of um, late 70s scene in New York had this a multiplicity of art forms, and to some extent, that's something that we look at, yes, quite strongly. And you know, I, I think one of the things we, we talked about as well is, you know, that that is a fantastic public program that you do, but you, you know, you you also collect personally. Um, so one of the questions is, do you do you share that widely? Uh, do you open it up? You know, is there a space that people can come by appointment or? No, no, not at all. And um, I'm obviously, I'm very uh, keen to lend the work if, 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 if uh, a Biennale wants the work or, mm. or there's some outside um, um, exhibition of that artist's work. But no, I take the view that the collecting side of what I do is a very personal thing. Mm. And um, so to some extent, over time, I guess I've, uh, the, the two parts of my life have, have, have become further and further apart. So. The, what the foundation does is more different to my collecting over time than, than it started. So, so, and because uh, I, I think there's increasingly, uh, you know, many people setting up private museums and so on, and I think this is increasing pressure quite often for collectors. Well, what are you going to do with it? You know, where is it going to go? Mm. Why can't we see it? Mm. And sometimes there's even a question of, of if a, a, a private collector buys a work, well, that work could have gone to a public institution. Now, I don't think, that, that's not a concern for me. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't think by privately buying a work, you're denying it to the public. Mm. And, and I think it's, it's often- But you don't disagree with people buying it and putting it in a, private collection? Well, ultimately, yes, absolutely. And ultimately, uh, you know, at the end of one's life, I mean, what happens with a collection? There's a whole other question mm. there, of course. And um, yes, no, I don't have any problem with that at all. Mm. But at this stage, I guess my interest is a very much a personal interest. And, mm. and also, I don't feel that everything has to be evident, if you like, like, why can't it be in a bottom drawer for a while? Why, mm. why can't it be revealed later? Mm. Why does everything, you know, I think that's one of the problems we have, you know, that we encounter with the internet. There's a, an expectation that everything is visible all of the time. It's always on Instagram. So you I, I think that's a very interesting point of view, which is why can't it be a best kept secret? I mean, p collecting could be a very personal pursuit and you know it, it, you, you don't necessarily have to open it up certainly not not immediately right In, indeed and why can't it then be discovered 40 years later and, mm. and maybe it'll be 
far more interesting if mm. it's discovered 40 years later. Okay, good. Well, then I want to ask uh, Hideki that, that question, which is, um, you know, I, I think because that tees up a very interesting question around the, the responsibility of a collector, right? So I think Philip have two sides of, two facets of what, what he does at the public and the private and privately, you know, I think you're saying, let's, let's keep it for a best kept secret for a while and, you know, at, at the right point it will be reviewed, right? Um, you know, I, if I just looking from the outside, it looks like um, the, the foundation and uh, the Naoshima Art Project has taken maybe a slightly different approach, right? I mean, you, you collect and you, and you show it to the public. What, what do you think is the responsibility of a collector? Well, there may be many styles of collectors, so I can't say which is wrong and which is right. Uh, but then I think, yes, uh, what we are doing is totally opposite. I myself, my father, we do not have any painting at home. We do not have any personal collection. Uh, but then, uh, basically, we believe in messages which uh, art uh, can convey. So I think uh, we have been doing, uh, we have been conveying a very strong message as well through the art. So what we are doing is a bit different. We are always thinking of using art. What can we achieve? Therefore, our art is not like, n not really a collection. It's uh, rather a commissioned work. Okay, this is accumulation of commissioned work. So this is a public bus. Uh, this is Shindo Otake. Uh, this is a famous artist. He uh, created it. And he created it because local people needed it. Yeah, local people said before there was a very nice public bus. Well, can't you make it, Fukutake san? So that's why we commissioned the work. And then we prepared this public bus, which is very beautiful. So not only Mr. Otake, the artist, uh, but also the local residents participated in it. Uh, Mr. Otake actually used a lot of uh, wasted materials. And then local people, they were very much interested. And then they found out Mr. Otake is using wasted material. So the resident brought the uh, wasted material from their own home. So this is really unique. So rather, uh, you know, uh, we really, what we have done is that we look at the needs of the resident and then what is best. Particularly, I think some of you, you probably know, the Hong Kongers probably know that uh, if you go to Japan, we have a very uh, public bus and then also the uh, uh, hot springs, so, you know, we communicate uh, in the uh, uh, in the bus stop, uh, you know, without any clothes. So, I think this is the place. Uh, you, This is the only place in the world that uh, you take off all the clothes, you become naked, and you enjoy the work of art. Very open and uh, naked. <laughs> Oh, we just missed it. That, that. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah, that was the bus. So I think it's fascinating to hear that there's really very divergent practices in, in collecting, you know, from negotiating between the private and public, which is what, Philip, you're saying, to, you know, really it's about building something that people want, as you said, right? It's really what um, you commission work that people want, and, you know, as a result, you know, everyone is engaged. Um, you know, clearly, there's you know there's a very wide range of practice. You know what, what what's interesting and what's on my mind is certainly collecting can be radical, but you know there are also all kinds of different practices out there. Let's say right. So maybe that's a question to Aaron first, and then to to Philip and Hidake, which is you know there are all these things that collectors are doing. Do you think that there are? Have you seen things that collectors do that makes you uncomfortable? Do you think? Are there things that collectors should not be doing? That's a good question. Um, if this wasn't fully recorded, I probably would completely go off script. <laughs> or maybe go off on one. Um, 
let's see how to find a diplomatic way to answer that question. Um, okay, well, uh, okay, for our work, let me, I'll backtrack slightly. So we're largely privately funded. So Delfina Entre Canales, our founder, supports a majority kind of of our costs. So we work with a lot of patrons and collectors as well who support and help us co-commission through the residency program. Um, there are also a lot of uh, collectors who follow our work, um, partly because we are helping to support and generate the next generation kind of, of artist. And I think there, and, so, and, and I also consider us to be a relatively kind of like small art space, a, a small nonprofit, alongside many of our colleagues. And I guess what sometimes upsets me the most is that our programs are followed very closely by collectors solely for the acquisition of works, of, you know, of knowing which cheap, young, hot things to buy right now, to speculate on. Yet and still, they're not actually supporting the organizations who are giving that opportunity to those artists to develop their practice, to gain a foothold within kind of the art world that then will give them the position um, to um, you know, create fantastic works and then of course be acquired by museums and galleries and blah, blah, blah. So I think the thing kind of like not to do is not to support the small initiatives that are out there. And wherever you're watching and you're, if you're following a certain institution, then see how you can support them financially, even if it is at the very, very lowest level of their tier of support, but try and kind of support kind of like the grassroots organizations. Often what we find with collectors is for the social cachet, they'll join the big mu museum groups, the big acquisition groups, and that's fine. Of course, that's a certain, they need support to collect kind of work and to, um, to be the kind of the guardians of kind of like art for the next uh, uh, generations to come. But if the work isn't produced, if we're not helping to generate new names and new voices, then what the hell are we all doing here in the art world if we're just kind of just circulating the same kind of ideas over and over? There was a great kind of, um, you know, uh, art newspaper um, article about museum shows in America and how, you know, they all come from a, kind of, a quite kind of few kind of number of galleries. Well, there's a responsibility of the collectors who are out there who are following young spaces to help try and get new names circulating within kind of the, the ecosystem of, of kind of the art world. So what, they sh what collectors should not do is keep the world narrow. Invest in the next, ge next generation. How about you, Philip? And I fully expect completely different answers, yeah, yeah. conflicting answers. So Going to be. go for um, it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> well, I think the really interesting thing about um, private collecting is it can be so varied and different. And I think um, sometimes it's sometimes a bit of a trap for private collectors that they start to see what public coll uh, collections do and then try to, without the resources, often um, try and um, equate a similar process. Because I think collecting can be so many different things. It can be collecting as archive. You know, there's an there's a, there's a archive called the Matsona Archive in Hamburger Bahnhof, which is, he collected a whole lot of material which were, were the works themselves, but also a whole lot of programs, books, magazines. And so you've got a whole cross-section of a, of a period of work in an archive, so it's an archive collection. You've got collecting and social history. If you look at the Uli Sig um, collection, it has this whole sense of like, I want to collect a whole uh, uh, social history of a, of a, of a, of a country at a, you know, over a certain time period. Or uh, collecting can be a form of curiosity, a form of national identity, uh, an expression of political commitment. It can be play, it can be intervention, it can be... So there's whole lots of different things. And I think the important thing for collectors is that they should work out what interests them and what they want to do and what they want to push and not feel constrained to do what everyone else does or to some extent do what um, institutions do. They should feel quite free to just completely go off, off track, if you like. So don't, don't chase the trend. Do what, do what you like. Well, you can chase the trend. That, might, that's what that like. might be the thing you want to do. Set the trend. But yes. you don't have to do that. You can do anything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What about you, Hideki? What do other collect collectors do that makes you uncomfortable? What should they be not doing? 
あの I thought, oh, I like this、uh, work very much.、Uh, but then it was already purchased by、uh, other collectors.、Uh, you, you know, I feel you know, bad. But that's, that's about it. So, s h o u l d should try to make sure that,、uh, you know, get, get to the front of the queue, or maybe. <laughs> And I think that that's what's happening next year with Art Basel. Maybe, you know, there will be. There will be a different section where, where people can come in a little bit early. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I learned a lot in this、uh, Art Basel. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, and with that, I think we will open up for questions from the floor. So、um, if you had a question, raise your hand and someone will run to you with a mic if they are ready. Yep, so they're at the back.、So. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. It was really interesting.、Um, and I, I wanted to just sort of go back to something that Philip had said.、Uh, I mean, well, Philip, you said that you had sort of originally trained as an artist.、Um, and I wonder how each of you sort of interpret、uh, the practice of collecting as a sort of form of artistry、um, or a composition in some senses. I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Um, I haven't said anything about my own personal background.、Um, also, study dance、um, and economics. So, I see everything I do as a certain kind of choreography、uh, to it, even though I don't、um, practice professionally anymore. Well, I say I have a socially engaged dance practice, which means I basically dance in nightclubs、um, and at fair parties. But、um, <laughs> I do see kind of what, you know, also collecting as a certain kind of choreography、um, to it. I do see it as a practice. I'm not going to say an artistic practice. I think for some collectors it is an artistic practice. For others, it is a practice in terms of it being a commitment, something that has a dedication and a rigor and some research to it.、Um, even to the point where we at Delfina Foundation are launching a program of doing collectors in residence and doing it alongside kind of artists. This is for two reasons. One is to collapse the distance between kind of collectors and artists, because often the space is mediated by galleries or advisors, and sometimes museum groups who do like the studio visits you know, to the artist studio. We actually want to create、uh, a space where、um, there's more dialogue between collectors、uh, and artists, because there is a very interesting kind of practice that's, that, that's, that's shared, and also, the, and also the idea of accumulation, which is what artists do naturally when they're building. Uh, towards, a, towards work, if it's research, if it's materials, if it's、uh, ideas and networks that get them to a certain point. For the collector, again, it's also accumulation kind of experiences that lead towards the accumulation of objects.、Um, and, but on the other hand, I also wanted to, to develop it, a, a collector in residence program to highlight to、um, young and emerging kind of collectors. Very interesting practices that are happening, particularly around kind of collectors who are, who are, who are collecting more challenging mediums、um, and who are also、um, going beyond the context of just the object and thinking kind of exactly kind of what Philip is、uh, doing with the foundation.、Um, and so I want to give more kind of profile for that kind of work as well to inspire others to, to follow them. So, within the context of Delfina Foundation, yes, I do certainly see it as a As a, there is a, a practice embedded within that. And it's one thing that we're going to do over the next kind of few years is to kind of amplify that through、um, the Collect and Residence、uh, program, which will be short, like a week or two weeks, because of course you're busy people.、Um, we had a pilot, it was a huge success, and so we're going to roll it out、um, shortly. So,、um, yes,、um, I think it again becomes a very personal、um, it's a very personal approach. So I think like、um, some collectors, and I, I, I am. Completely in awe of collectors who are archivists, because I'm not. And I think they're fantastic that they can sit down and collect all, the,、uh, the, all this stuff, paraphernalia, what, all kinds of material, and organise it in a very rigorous way.、Um, that's personally not my interest. My interest is, is, to, is often to kind of enter into the creative process that the artist has, has done in some sense. 
So I empathise with the process. Obviously, I'm not doing the process. I'm separated from it. I'm, I'm at a distance. But I think it's um, that's personally what interests me, that, that, that there is a creative engagement with, that, with, the, with the process that the artist had in the first place. And that's what ex usually excites me about a work. Um, Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask another question. Yeah. Um, well, I actually have two questions. I mean, the first one is related to the work that, um, I mean, Philip, also you're involved with the Sydney Biennial and Hideaki, also the, the Satochi Biennial. Um, I'm curious about how that uh, breaks down the boundary between public and private in some ways, how you, your sort of the personal instinct to collect or to support practices becomes a uh, a much larger project that engages with communities. Um, and then the second question actually is for Alan, because you have just been such a wonderful moderator today. But of course, we haven't heard about your practice. So I hope maybe after we think about the biennials and the public-private boundaries, we can also think about your own practice as a, uh, and how you would define it. And I'm also very curious how um, you have sort of, how you might reflect on the conversation that's happened today. Um, well, uh, yes, biennials I find very interesting, and, and to some extent, in my uh, they, they they are the middle position between what I'm interested in. So, on one one hand, I, as I've said, I've got the foundation which I support things directly, and then there's this collection. And but quite often, I end up buying works that have appeared at, uh, at biennials, or um, so I actually find um, that the whole uh, my whole interest in uh, biennales and biennials is a kind of middle station between the two other parts of what I do because it, um, it, it I mean, I guess my involvement with, with Biennials was, was being on a board, so I'm not, I'm not creatively involved, but I got very interested in what, where, what was happening, in, what, what Biennials happened in different places, and I've attempted to see as many as possible. Um, so, and I, so I find that situation very interesting because, um, by and large, there's lots of new art being produced, but it's being produced in a pro where, where you can often see the process of it being produced. While sometimes at art fairs, it's a little harder because you see the finished product, but you don't often see what's behind it. So um, I guess that's why I really like biennials, because they provide that middle station. And as I say, I find them very uh, exciting as a collector because um, I can see what's what's... I get a much better sense of why someone's made something and then I can enter into the process of getting excited about buying it. Do you want to add a little bit to the whole private and public um, question that, that was raised? Yeah, sorry, it was the Satoshi Triennial, not the Biennial. Well, uh, the enjoying the process of uh, you know, art being created, I think th uh, that is exactly the same we are doing. We have uh, Seto Uchi, Seto Indan Si uh, Triennale, and uh, for that uh, Triennale, for each Triennale, uh, you know, we really have accumulation of various activities and knowledge. And then after the Triennale, uh, you know, everything became zero, and then three years later, we have to create again. So if you have something, and then you break everything, you make it zero, and then we make another one. Uh, that is not our style. So what we do is uh, whatever there is existing, we make use of it. So rather than breaking the existing thing and then b creating new thing, that is not uh, what we do. What we are interested in is really we focus on the existing thing and then uh, we will uh, make m create something on top of it. So if you look at the entire process, every time there is new things going on, every time there is a creation, 
If you visited Naoshima, you will understand every year things are different, you know. You see the different scenery, different uh, work. So if you visited Naoshima three years ago, uh, come again, you will enjoy brand new things. So maybe just to do a little bit of marketing. <laughs> I think the one, the March when it just started, it's going to go on for a month, the next one is in July, and then the next one is in fall, so you can really see, I mean, I've been once, and, and I absolutely is in love with the place. So do you end up collecting work that was shown in the Satuchi Trianu, and, and that goes into um, the, 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 the Naoshima art site and the Fukudake collection? Uh, well, not all the works. Actually, uh, you know, this triennale is uh, held every three years. Uh, so this is a commission work. Uh, so it, there is an advantage, but then this advantage is that uh, sometimes, you know, it's a bit different from what we originally thought, and then you cannot take it away. So, you know, what we do is that, uh, you know, there is a work, and then if it is really suitable for the localities, of course, Triennale is held for 100 days. So if it really fits with Naoshima, we leave it. And then if it is total mismatch, of course, uh, we will withdraw such uh, works. Uh, that's how we do. Well, sometimes uh, the foundation uh, purchased the work, and uh, for some works, I think it's possible that uh, uh, you know Kagawa Prefectural Government might buy. That's great. So you know that there's a real good flow and exchange between, I guess, you know, in the, in this case, the Trianu and uh, the, the collecting part of it, um, and then maybe to to your question about um, what I do. Um, uh, so you know, I, I collect you know I collect around a couple of narratives and themes. Um, some of those are more global. Um, you know, I, I, I love what's going on. Uh, not the cliche post-internet stuff, but certainly something that has a strong technology element and thinking uh, uh, behind it. Um, you know, I'm very fascinated about how we get very confused about culture as we all become global citizens. So there are a couple of things that I collect that are very global. Um, but I also feel that we're in a very unique place and we're very privileged to be sitting where we are right now, which is there's so much going on from a political and economic point of view sitting in Hong Kong and China. So you know that clearly is also a very big part of what I collect. And at least in the past few years, what I try to do is in addition to um, collecting works that I think build to us that narrative, I'm trying to fill it in with different things that are not really art. They're, they're more objects. So j just to give you an example, um, you know, I've collected a police uniform from uh, colonial British time because I think that's such an important thing and you know, I'm sure many of you have read what's happening in Hong Kong in the past, uh, in the past year. Um, I had something that uh, a set of slogan and protest slogans and uh, the boxes that were used for the first democratic election in a small village in China, the first and maybe the last, um, uh, and, the, and the first one since uh, in 1949. So these are not art object produced by artists per se, but for me they are very important uh, things that fills in that narrative that I'm trying to build, again, being very privileged and sitting where we are, I almost feel there's a responsibility that would build to us something, and maybe that's kind of close to what Philip, you were saying earlier, which is, you know, it's not something that I open up and, uh, and, and show everyone, although I think some of you may have been to my studio, but I think maybe at some point, um, I, I'd love to share it, and hopefully it kind of makes sense, you know, basically, a collection of creation from artists and a set of objects that have pulled together, which I think documents our time. Any other questions from the floor? There's more. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> going to ask one more question. I can't help myself. Um, well, I mean, just to sort of round it off, then I'm so curious how each of you would define the role of collecting in the 21st century. And in, or the potential of the role of the collector in the 21st century. 
um, and in turn, what advice you would give to collectors who are, or burgeoning collectors, people who are going to become the collectors of the future. Thank you. Wow, I'm put on the spot first. Um, I might, I'm not gonna chicken out by doing this, but I'm gonna actually, I wanna repeat the things that I said before, which I do think that kind of the role of the collection is kind of like this body of evolving knowledge. And particularly in the 21st century where technology and there's such rapid change in our globalized world, it's important for that evolution to keep at pace with how times are changing. Um, bearing in mind that um, in the contours of time, this is one small fold of it, but it's still important to kind of document, as you were saying, Alan, kind of this point in time. And then advice for um, uh, emerging uh, collectors is to kind of buy with your heart and to support, uh, again, small initiatives, again. It, yes, well, I think, as I said before, I think it's very much about identifying what really interests you. Um, like, I was interested to hear Alan's um, the expanse of what he's interested in, which he extends right into through into social history. And so, um, like, that's a very interesting approach, and it's quite unique to some extent. And I think that that's the important thing for, for private collectors to to really find your own heart and, and find your own direction. And as I say, don't worry about a lot of the white noise that's in the market and don't worry about what institutions do and just find what you're interested in and what's practical and what's around about and what you can afford, obviously, and, um, and, and take it from there. I don't Hi. Yeah, well, I think uh, collector can play and contribute a lot to society. Well, because uh, what we have done is really we have been pursuing uh, the efficiency only. But then, what we now, th what we think now, is that uh, we have to live happily. If you look at Japan, uh, Nara city of Nara and Kyoto, uh, there is a long tradition and a rich culture. So I think uh, for the art, I think since uh, Renaissance era, I think uh, collector has been playing a big role. So my role, I think, uh, what I think uh, is that as a collector, uh, well, when we start to support uh, the artist, I think it is important. Continuity is the most important thing. Well, you, you know, some collector may say, oh, if I have more money, I will buy. Well, a lot of Japanese young generations, uh, you know, uh, they say, okay, if I have money, I buy. But then I think continuity is very important important. So uh, for us, uh, really, we will continue to carry out our activity. Um, I, I do think there is a, a responsibility, um, you, know, as, you know, at least that's what I'm trying to do, which is um, collect things that I think document our time. And that doesn't mean buying current work. And, you know, just to give an example, you know, I'm fascinated by technology, so it doesn't mean that I'm buying things that are produced now, but you know, you should go back in time. And why shouldn't you be collecting Namjin Pak if you like technology? Why shouldn't you be collecting uh, Liam Hersher, her radical practice in the 60s, if you like technology? So you know, I think, but but all that builds to us something that I think document, you know, location-wise, time-wise, where we are. And uh, you know, I I think that that would be an important responsibility. And I think. Um, it is a great time to buy. I think maybe Adeline might disagree with me. I think the market has slowed slightly, and, and, and that's great. That means you have a little bit more time to think about it, to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, be annoying. Just push and, and, and ask and try to understand. And, and I guess what, at least what I've learned is uh, don't be afraid to buy things you don't understand, because eventually it's things that you don't understand that keep fascinating you.
And can I also just say, add something that's actually cheap. It's completely free. Well, maybe it'll cost you a drink and a dinner. But like, befriend an artist. You know, like, actually hang out with artists. If you're, you know, you're gonna learn the most, you know, by actually, you know, talking with artists in their studios, taking them out to lunch, whether you like their work or not. But perfectly if you do, you're gonna learn a lot about the process. And I think, do, do, do not be fearful of that kind of engagement. Do not think you have to go via the gallery, you know, to you. If you have a gallery friendship, certainly do. But it's much better if you can go directly, kind of like to an artist. I'm not saying to buy works. Support the galleries, because they're playing an important role in developing that artist's career. But I'm saying befriend the artist. Uh, you'll learn a lot from that. Wonderful. And I think with that, we would wrap up. And I uh, want to thank you, the wonderful panelist, who's telling us how collecting can can be how incredibly radical and different. Thank you very much.